Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I say I'm David Prosser. I'm executive director of uh, RO UK, and it's my pleasure to welcome you uh, to this uh, webinar um, this afternoon, where we're going to be uh, looking at UNSUB, a, a tool to aid the evaluation of uh, big deals. Um, big deals have been controversial even since their introduction, which is now probably about 20 years ago. Um, while they provide convenience and improve cost per title, they also type an ever-increasing proportion of libraries acquisition budgets, uh, reducing the flexibility that institutions have in managing those budgets, and have helped drive even greater uh, consolidation in the market. So there were already concerns, but then the last few months and uh, the uh, COVID crisis has uh, exacerbated that. Um, I know that many institutions um, around the UK and Ireland are looking at uh, modelling really significant um, budget cuts and those cuts such that um, you know there isn't a lot to take a lot of room in which to make those cuts because of, of, of um, the ever-increasing amount of money that big deals take. Um, the UK High Level Journals Negotiation Group which our UK sits on has written to publishers recently as I'm sure you know looking for 25% price cuts for journal big deals. And it'll be interesting to see what response uh, we get um, from, from the publishers. And also we're at the start of the process to negotiate the next uh, big deal with Elsevier. And the current deal ends in December of next year, of 2021, but we know it will take many months to reach a satisfactory uh, conclusion uh, for that deal. Um, over the past 10 years, really, we've been looking at uh, issues around the data needed to make decisions on big deal. Um, today, those con uh, conversations are led by our collection strategy network, and it's that network that decided it would be useful to learn more about uh, UNSUB and, and its capacity to aid decision making. But we realise that this is a, a much wider issue than just the um, RUK members, and so we've opened up this webinar to a wider audience, and we're very pleased to see so many of you joining us uh, today. With that being said, I, I want to... Uh, um, um, welcome Heather Pivovar to um, um, talk to us uh, about UNSUB. Heather's going to speak for about 30 odd minutes and then we'll have a question and answer session after that. And we're hugely grateful to Heather, uh, especially because um, she's on the west coast of the States where it's um, just past uh, eight o'clock in the morning. Um, so we're particularly grateful that she's made this time um, to, to talk through UNSUB um, with us. And uh, with that, I shall hand over to you, Heather. Fantastic. Thanks so much, David. I am absolutely thrilled to be talking um, to you. We were hoping to be at um, UKSG and needless to say that didn't work out. So um, to the extent that this is seeing you and <laughs> getting a chance to talk, I'm really glad about it. Um, please do ask questions. Uh, the, we'll, we will leave a lot of time for questions. In fact, we can even go over time if need be. Um, during the conversation, during my talk, um, do add, ask those questions in the Q&A and they'll get um, answered at the end, but that way you won't forget the questions. Uh, the questions are pretty key to understanding everything. Okay, with no further ado, I am going to share my screen. Hopefully the right screen. Okay. Does that look good? Can you guys see that okay? I'm assuming no news is good news. Okay, here we go. So what I'm here to talk with you about unsub. Um, this is, oh, sometimes you don't have a picture of me. So this is what I look like. And this is the other half of unsub, Jason Prem. Please, if we ever do run into each other at uh, UKSG or anywhere else, uh, do say hi. We'd love to catch up. Okay, so um, I work for the nonprofit Our Research. I'm one of the two founders, along with Jason. We've been around for about eight years um, doing various things. We're, we are a nonprofit based in the US, uh, although I currently live in Canada, um, dual citizen, which is wonderful, but that's a touchy subject, so maybe we'll talk about that. Anyway, um, everything we do is open source, open data, open access. We're a nonprofit because our goal is to accelerate the transition to open science. And we try to practice what we preach um, with our infrastructure. So that's a little bit about who we are and what we believe in. Um, but I'm not going to be talking about 
that part um, that much more because it, although that's cool, um, it's actually about to get even cooler with the functionality. And so uh, put on your seatbelts. So you might already be using some tools that we make. So we are the people behind Unpaywall, um, which as you might know, is a complete open, well, it's an attempt to be a complete, it's the most complete um, open and legal index of open access with very high accuracy that has driven its integration into a lot of different systems. So you might already be using Unpaywall if you use Web of Science, Scopus, ProQuest, dimensions and so on. Um, all of the open access links in those systems come from un the Unpaywall database. Also, you yourself might have Unpaywall turned on in your link resolver. Um, if you don't, you should. It's free. Most, almost all, I think, major link resolver vendors have the ability to configure it so that if a patron goes to a um, a paper and you don't have it in your subscription holdings, it checks the unpaywall database, sees if we know of a legal, um, good quality open access version. If so, the patron will be redirected there. And only if one of those does not exist, does it go to your interlibrary loan page. So you may have that turned on. If not, uh, go ahead and turn that on right now and, uh, and help unleash the power of open access. So we've been doing that for several years now. Um, and we have are now using the unpaywall data in a different product. Right, I forgot to mention the browser extension may be a different way you're using it. So a quarter of a million people actively use the browser extension. Um, it's available for Chrome and Firefox. There are lots of browser extensions out, uh, out these days. Ours is really pretty though, so you should go give it a shot. <laughs> it also powers the data behind um, pretty much everybody else's browser extension for what it's worth. So this on Paywall database, we pull together um, probably data from your institutional repository actually using your OAI PMH endpoint. We've got thousands of those endpoints and we harvest them daily. And then we um, add on value to that by detecting if there is actually a full text, an open, um, no registration required, um, free full text copy of the paper at that repository, determine its version and so on, its license, and pull that into a database. We merge that with information we've got about gold and hybrid and bronze, all the flavors of open access you could want, uh, and metadata from Crossref. That's what that unpaywall database is for what it's worth. Um, we wrote a paper using the data from the Unpaywall database here, um, and this paper was in PRJ a few years ago. Uh, we wrote a preprint um, for using this data to forecast uh, just late last year. What we found in doing those studies with that Unpaywall data is that right now, sort of at the end of 2019, beginning of 2020, in non-COVID times, which is probably what we'll go back to after COVID, I'm guessing, though nobody knows, of course, is that about half of all article views that researchers try to do are actually available as free open access. So half, not papers, because that's only so interesting, right? Half of what people actually want to read at the time they want to read it is available as open access. And even better, in five years time, that will be 70%. So that's open access is really coming of age, right? When we start to get those numbers. It also means that right now, only half of the articles that people want to read need to be purchased in order to read them quickly and conveniently. And in five years, that will be only 30%. The value of a journal subscription is collapsing, and that is obviously why journal subscription prices keep dropping. And this is where if we were in person, you would laugh and you would hear the person beside you laugh and it would sound like laughing instead of the stone cold silence I am currently hearing, but I'm hoping you're laughing at home. Anyway, so they're not dropping, right? but they should be. And so especially, and that was true, you know, this product launched in November. That was true in November. It's all the more true now. Um, everybody's belt tightening. So what we want to do is help you cancel your big deal with confidence. You might need to cancel your big deal, but it's scary. You might not know if you want to cancel your big deal, um, but you want to check it out and you want some data to help you know uh, whatever decision you make um, to do with confidence. So that's really what the tool I'm going to be demoing for you today is all about. Um, it's really looking at cost versus co convenient fulfillment, because of course libraries were committed to getting patrons what they need. We'll get it by interlibrary loan. We'll get it to them best we can. So it's not so much fulfillment as convenient fulfillment. That's what actually um, carries the bulk of the cost. 
And the way that's often measured is through cost effectiveness and cost effectiveness is measured through cost of use. So that's what the tool um, indeed uh, uses to measure subscription value. So traditionally cost of use um, just involves usage as measured by downloads and cost um, just the cost of subscriptions. And that's what goes into standard cost of use to determine um, subscription value. And what we're doing is bringing to that some more data. So we're saying in addition to usage, what we're really trying to get with usage is the value of the data. Uh, sorry, the value of the journal to your institution, right? And downloads is one metric of that value. Another is how many times do people in your um, institution cite papers in that journal, because that's kind of an, e that, that describes value, right? How many times do authors in your institution um, author papers in that journal? So we're, we're adding all those things um, into usage in this sort of more advanced cost per use metric um, that we will be talking about. In addition to cost of just the subscription, if you don't subscribe, the cost isn't zero, right? Because we still have a cost of interlibrary loan. So another uh, refinement we're making to standard cost per use is we're using net cost of a subscription. And that's the cost of a subscription minus the cost of what the ILL would be if you didn't actually subscribe to that title. And finally, we're adding, um, instead of just cost per use, we think it's important it's cost per paid use, so that you're not paying for free. So if an article is available open access, as it increasingly is, in your perpetual access back file, in places like ResearchGate or something like that, um, you might, you shouldn't consider that the money you're paying the publishers for that is money well spent. So we're excluding that from the cost per use metric to get your real subscription value. Now, I do want to take, before we go further, it's really important, as I've been saying, that that OA is open at the time of use, backfile at the time of use. That's complicated, obviously, because uh, green embargoes mean that papers are often not OA during that first year. And of course, people most want to read papers during their first year. So there's a bunch of curves that are going on, and we're taking care of all that math. That's true for backfile too, because your backfile, if you cancel a journal subscription and the perpetual access stops, that perpetual access is really valuable um, the first day and the second day, but becomes decreasingly valuable as it only holds older and older articles, right? So there's a bunch of like complicated math that's going and modeling that's going into um, uh, getting this right, and we're taking uh, all of that into account. In, the, in this forecast model, which I'm going to demonstrate. So it's a model projecting the costs and the fulfillment for every journal for the next five years, because you don't want to know the open access use right now. You're looking at making decisions that will affect the next five years. Now, of course, the next five years are a little tricky, a little trickier to predict now than they were in November, to be fair. Um, but we think that, but one thing we're doing actually is continually updating the model with the best available evidence we've got. So the goal is to have an accurate as we can uh, prediction of the next five years. Okay, so we create this forecast model um, by data that you bring and data that we bring. The data that you bring is a counter file and um, then optionally customized uh, prices and your own customized list of what you've got perpetual access to. And that's it. Um, and we just need the counter to start the other ones we can use defaults. Um, and the data that we bring to it is open access data from unpaywall and citation and authorship data from the open data set that Microsoft provides. So it's like Google Scholar but or Scopus or, what, or so on, but they have not put an emphasis on their UI um, like those other companies have. Instead, they've put an emphasis on making their data um, openly accessible for tools like us to build on. So. That's, uh, that's how that works. It's called Unsub, if you haven't heard. <laughs> Here's a quick screenshot, but actually I'm gonna give you a demo, so I'm just gonna blow by these right now. Um, to cut to the chase, it costs $1,000 US per year right now. So that's what it's cost for the last six months. Um, we've actually, it, it, does, it is not dependent on um, bands or anything at the moment, but we are reevaluating that because we're trying to uh, make sure that we can scale, that it's, it remains a super good value. Um, we want everybody to have this data that's really important to us. Um, and so we've actually got a survey where we're trying to um, get the 
community's feedback um, about our pricing. Right now, it's $1,000 a year, and we're determined to keep it um, accessible to everybody. To get started, all it costs, all it takes is one counter file. 300 libraries are using it. Most of those are in the U.S. right now. Um, I think because that they had a few conferences <laughs> before uh, before everything hit, unfortunately. Um, but some UK universities are using it, uh, as well as um, all universities in Canada and some Australian ones, um, making up those 300 universities. There's um, about half of that is individual universities and the other half is consortia. <clears throat> uh, SUNY was one of the, the State University of New York is an, um, sort of a consortium of 60, 60 universities in the state of New York. <clears throat> they were one of our earliest users and they were in the midst of an LCFR negotiation. And they actually decided to walk away from their big deal um, a few months ago and they talked about this publicly. You can read about this. Um, and they're saving $5 million and said that unpaywall um, or unsub is what it actually was, uh, changed the conversation for us. So they found it really useful. Uh, and so that's one of our um, most clear testimonials we think that can um, suggest you take a look. So let's go take a look. You can follow along if you want to. Go to unsub.org uh, right now. Everything I'm about to show you is publicly available. Uh, we're also on Twitter at, at unsub underscore org. Um, okay. Okay. So here we are at unsub.org. Um, and we are going to try the demo. <laughs> so you can, you can follow along at home if you want. So I'm going to type in an, my email address. So. Okay. Oh, I didn't like that. I'm giving it an email address it hasn't seen before so we can see a clean fresh demo not one where I fiddled okay so we're in so what this demo is is um, it's really what you would see if you were to get a custom dashboard customized with your counter file um, but it's for an unnamed uh, US university it's a fairly large university with a med school in case that helps you interpret the results um, but a bunch of our customers um, are big, are very big, and a bunch of our customers are small. Um, Unsub can really uh, help everybody. Also, for what it's worth, if you don't have a big deal, if you've already um, negotiated, a, if you already have gone to um, a la carte subscriptions, needless to say, Unsub can still be relevant to help you figure, fine tune that um, subscription list. So if you've got questions about specifically how can that work uh, feel free to ask them but I think you'll be able to put your imagination hat on during this demo if that's your situation and um, and see how that would work as well okay so here we are at this demo university and um, the publisher that's set up in the demo is Elsevier right now uh, unsub supports Elsevier out of the box uh, Wiley as well though you've got to upload your data through us for another couple of days until we um, ship that code update that'll let you update the code yourself uh, for Wiley. Springer Nature is coming next and all other publishers uh, over the course of the next year in order based on priority for our customers. So if you've got some deals that are coming up that are important to you, uh, let us know that matters to us because we really, we're in this, we're a nonprofit, we're in this to help you and to help librarians um, have a data balance with publishers and make the changes they need to make to make the scholarly communication system nimble to change. That's our goal. Okay, right now we're going to click on Elsevier. And the tool actually um, covers both the read and the publish side of a subscription of a publisher negotiation. Now it doesn't cover them equally. The focus at the moment is on the read side so it's on the subscription side but we do have a little bit that estimates your um, APC spend as well I'm going to cover that at the end it's right here um, so I'll come back to that and and cover that um, but we're, what we're going to do is dive in uh, right now to the uh, most interesting guts which is to model what does it look like if you were to walk away from your big deal 
So we click on a scenario. The idea is that you can save different scenarios uh, with different assumptions and settings and compare and contrast. So it can help you as a decision support tool. Okay, and here we are. <laughs> so this is the main, the main page um, that is giving you some data. So let me give you an explanation of what data we're seeing. I'll actually start here in this second bar, this instant fulfillment, it says at the top, 61%. So starting at the bottom of that, the bottom part of that bar says 35% um, open access. What does that mean? What it means is over the next five years, so, so this, all of the scenario is modeling the next five years, and then we look at it annually. So the average of the next five years, because people are used to thinking annually, so it's a forecast and then, then we look at it annually. And you can dig into the detailed years in various ways I can show you. But So in the next five years, of all the uses, so a combination again of downloads, citations, and um, authorships we can talk about, all the uses, 35% of them will be available open access at the time of the request for this large US university. So that's the first takeaway, which is actually pretty exciting. I should say, actually, sorry, I, I got a bit ahead of myself. This is Elsevier, it's everything in their big deal, that Elsevier is currently publishing that isn't an open, a gold open access journal because it's not relevant for a big deal and so on, right? So that's 1,855 uh, journals that have publicly available prices on the Elsevier site. And then you can upload your own custom quoted prices if you want to get the last 100 or so that are only available custom prices. So, so across all those 1,855 journals, all the uses to them, 35% are available open access. In addition to that, we estimate about another 25% are available perpetual access. Now that depends a bit on your own um, perpetual access um, holdings, but um, it is on for, especially for large universities, it tends to be um, about, about at this level. And then, as I said, you can customize it um, to get it more precise for you. So what that means is 35 plus 26 uh, gets you to 61% of all uses are actually fulfilled already instantly, even if you cancel your big deal and don't subscribe to anything. So that's, that's, a, pretty, that's a pretty interesting takeaway, yeah? Now, what, what about those 39%? Um, that aren't. Well, as we know, um, authors, if they run into a paper they can't quickly get, if they actually didn't really need that paper, they'll go Google and find another paper, right? Or maybe they'll ask the author, or maybe they'll learn how to Sci-Hub, or maybe they will um, make an interlibrary loan request. And so what this tool is doing is it's modeling interlibrary loan requests at the rate that they do happen in real life. So, um, the literature and people's experiences suggest that, that about one out of every 20 times somebody tries to get a paper and they can't get it easily, they make an interlibrary loan request. If your interlibrary loan is uh, super well marketed and your researchers love it and they do it even more, uh, that's a parameter you can change, um, for example. But we are modeling right now uh, that sort of literature-based default, all of the defaults we've done, we've tried to set them to the um, literature-based default. So we're assuming that one out of every 20 of these requests will be an interlibrary loan request. And then we further assume that a fulfilling an interlibrary loan request costs $17 US. Uh, again, that's literature value, but if that's not what it costs you, uh, you can change that. So you putting all this data together about the fulfillment rate and the cost and so on, we estimate that um, fulfilling interlibrary loan requests if they walk away from their big deal and subscribe to nothing, will cost about two hundred and thirty thousand uh, dollars U.S. And that's actually one tenth of what they were paying for their big deal, which was about two million dollars U.S. Okay, so that that starts to get that snapshot of what does it look like if I walk away from my big deal, right? How, how what does it look like in terms of fulfillment? What does it look like in terms of cost? Now let's say you actually are. Um, you want to save some money 
but you don't need to save that much money. <laughs> you want to trade off some money for some more convenience for your faculty and students, right? And so you can do that by subscribing to some journals a la carte. And so up here, we can model subscribing to some journals. So I'm just going to start clicking up, and this models subscribing to eight, 9, 10, 11 journals. And it's modeling subscribing to them with the most cost-effective cost journal first. So the one with the lowest cost per use. So let me show you what this graph is right here. It's a histogram where this x-axis right here, don't be scared by histograms. If you don't like histograms, it's not that bad. You can do it. So this along the bottom here is the cost per use from very low to very high. <laughs> and the very low, one nice nerdy detail, is our version of cost per use can actually be negative. If a journal is actually more expensive to fulfill by interlibrary loan than it would be to fulfill by a subscription, the cost per use the, is actually negative. So Cell um, has a very high use for many universities and a relatively low subscription price. So in this scenario, it's got a, a negative cost per use. All the way up to um, the Journal of Hospitality, Leisure, Sports, and Tourism. Oh, it's not a good time for them, is it? Anyway, they have a very high cost per use. Um, and then there's some more journals down here that have the even higher cost per uses. Um, but if so, so they're all just sorted in order from lowest, from the best cost effectiveness to the worst cost effectiveness. So if I just keep clicking up here, I keep pretending to subscribe to journals. Um, with the most uh, cost effective one first. So let me just press and hold this down till I've saved half um, my big deal price. So right now I'm saving a million dollars and look, it, I'm only running into inconvenient accesses 15% of the time, one five percent of the time, and I've saved half my subscription budget. Um, and it, we have indeed baked in that those 15%, your researchers are not out to lunch, Nope, they can make interlibrary loan requests and they can make them as often as um, you want them to. So here is that interlibrary loan piece. You can see it's uh, less than it was before, right? Because we're modeling subscribing to some more things. Here's those parameters. So interlibrary loan. If we say the interlibrary loan is actually going to happen twice as often, 10% of the time, you'll see that this um, bit jumps up. A little slow. There. So it now costs twice as much. Uh, th sorry, there are twice as many interlibrary loan requests now, and so it does end up costing twice as much. So these parameters here, you can explore them. I'm not going to go through each one, but the goal is that we've um, tried to make as a parameter, as a setting, anything that either we've had to make an assumption or you might want to. Um, the, and, and your, your um, university actually has a real value for, and maybe our value is different, like the transaction cost, maybe yours is cheaper, maybe yours is more expensive, maybe you want to model document delivery with it, and so maybe you want to make it be 25 or $30, and so you're assuming um, uh, document delivery rather than interlibrary loan. So, so the parameters are so that you can do it to your university settings, and then we've also made as a parameter various settings uh, where you might just want to try different risk profiles. So something that's very conservative, something that's not conservative. And some examples of that are, do you want to include research gate, ho gate hosted content? So if you're really up against it in terms of money, maybe you do. If on the other hand, you're deciding to take more of a principled stand about open access, maybe you want to look at what it looks like without that. So we've really tried to make as a parameter everything um, that makes this model ring true for you in your university. Uh, that's our goal. I've mentioned briefly um, the institutional weight, that, sorry, the citations and authorships being part of usage, the way that we do that is we give it a weight. So we assume that one citation counts like 10 downloads and one authorship counts like 100 downloads. But if you don't like that, you want to experiment with different things, you can click and change that. That gives you a, a sense of how customizable this is. Now, this picture is very, oh, you can, this picture is pretty, but um, if you're like me, you want to get into the nitty-gritty details, and so we have you covered on the nitty-gritty details 
you can look at the table view instead. And so here there's a row for each of those journals that was just a dot in the histogram. You can sort it by cost of use. And so here is the most cost effective one um, at the top. If we want to, um, for example, add in authorships. So let's see here, impact authorships. So maybe what we want to do is we want to say, let's model subscribing to 100 things, but we want to make sure that that we want to understand, does that co really cover every, we want it, so we're subscribing to 100 things, the most cost effective 100 journals is what we're doing right now. Now we want to see, does that cover the journals where our authors are publishing papers. So we can add this column for authored papers and then sort descending. And so the, for this university, they publish in the spine journal um, most frequently for all Elsevier subscription journals. Um, and then everything else a bit less than that. Now this one, um, the International Journal of Radiation Oncology and so on, uh, they publish in quite frequently, but it is relatively expensive. So it's not one of the most 100 uh, most cost effective journals. So it's not picked up um, by the quick and dirty modeling we just did. But what if we do want to subscribe to it? You can actually um, subscribe to things just one off. So I just did a command click and now it's subscribed. And you could do that, um, for example, to all of your high authored papers if you wanted to. Or one use case that people have talked about is they um, have a very, um, active nursing program. So let's just look at the nursing journals um, and see maybe um, maybe you have a faculty member who's very active on the board of the Journal of Neonatal Nursing. So even though it's not particularly cost effective, <laughs> even though it doesn't bubble to the top, it's good for your university to subscribe to that. that that's real, right? That's your job to, to know that and to do that. So um, again, you could subscribe to that. You could also go ahead and click on it um, to get more details. So here it shows you the cost per use um, as a combination of downloads, citations over the last five years, authors over the last five years and so on. Um, and there's also some uh, nitty gritty timeline data here. So uh, how much open access, what kinds of open access, things like that. Um, this pane isn't the prettiest right now. Uh, we're working on making it uh, better and have some good timeline graphs in the future. Um, yeah, okay, I think that is covering most of this section. Um, you can export a spreadsheet, you can save this scenario view and copy it, and then um, save a different one with different subscription lists and different parameters and so on um, to play around. So that that's a quick overview, I think, of um, how you can um, use this as a decision support tool to see what would it look like um, to walk away from your, from your big deals. Before I forget, let me go back and give you a quick overview of that APC piece. So here I'm going to dive in here. What this is saying is that for this university, they're spending about $94,000 a year on um, open access to Elsevier. So now we're going to dig in and see the details of that. So there's that $94,000 a year. So here's a list of all of the journals where authors from this institution have published papers that are either gold OA or hybrid OA. So again, gold OA is when the whole journal is open access. So, and hybrid OA is when that, not the whole journal is, but just that specific paper is. So we flag what type it is um, of the journal. So this is all the journals that are published by Elsevier that these authors are published in. And the, here's the APC price, the current APC price for published uh, article processing charge. Uh, for those who might not know, that's the cost that, it, um, that this journal charges authors to make their um, paper available open access. And what this tool isn't looking at is that money coming out of their research grant, is it coming out of um, their institutional OA fund? We're not paying any attention right in, in this tool in where that money is coming from. It's more just how much money 
are people in the university paying to Elsevier to publish open access? Because that number is ob can obviously be um, useful if you are looking at a read and publish agreement, but also, frankly, if you're just looking at a subscription agreement as part of your negotiation and to double check the publishers about their double, no double dipping claims and so on. Anyway, so that's the APC charge. Now, since that um, needs to be paid just once per article, but often articles have more than one author, including from more than one institution, it's a little tricky um, to figure out how that should be allocated across institutions. And so we are doing a, I can talk more about the pros and cons of this and, and the rationale behind it, but um, we're currently dividing that equally across all of the institutions on the paper and, and uh, allocating the APC price based on the fraction of the authorship list that is for your institution. So what, we're, what we've got here for each row is how many papers were published in that journal in the last, on average, uh, every year over the last five years. So the reason it's got a decimal point in it is it's on average over the last five years. And this is when we take into account that fractional authorship. So what proportion of the authorship list was an author from your institution? And then we multiply that uh, by the APC price to figure out the APC dollars spent uh, on that journal uh, by authors in your institution that year. So let me say, um, uh, that the US and Canada has not had very clean data um, in this regard. And so this pains particularly use for them. Now, if you're a um, part of the open APC project, for example, or are otherwise tracking this APC data through your accounting department in your university, this pain may not be very useful because it is an estimate um, and you may have more um, accurate ways. But for people without those estimates, it gets them in the ballpark uh, and, and gets conversation started. So that's a little bit of an overview on that page. Now, one thing that I should have covered first, because all of you have probably been wondering, um, but let me, let me at least do it now, um, is that obviously I've been talking about US dollars. Um, and right now, the tool only shows things in US dollars. Um, but we are uh, want to make this useful to people and prioritize our features based on uh, customers' feedback. And so obviously it would be useful if it were uh, um, showed pounds and eventually euros as well um, in it. And so if, this is, if that's a high priority feature for you, we'd love to hear about that. Um, and whether it's directly in email or on our user discussion group, uh, we definitely can, we're a small team uh, moving fast on this and prioritizing features, which isn't the easiest. So I'm not sure when it would happen, um, but certainly if there's a great big interest in that um, and, it, and it was required, um, it moves it up the, up the priority list. Okay. Yeah, I think that is a, there's, there's help as you, as you look around, do take a look at the knowledge base help. Um, there is a guided tour um, on the front, on the landing page. There's a video uh, that actually just does mostly what I did. <laughs> but uh, if you want to share that with others, you're welcome to. Yeah, and I think that's it. I'd love to answer your questions. Well, thanks, Heather. That was uh, brilliant. Um, really, really interesting. Um, I, I think the the fact about the the proportion of downloads or the, the amount of use or views that's open access is really interesting because traditionally we've always looked at the number of journals or even papers, but actually looking at it from from um, from from usage is 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 really interesting. Um, we have. A lot of questions. Um, actually, okay. some, of them, some of them you answered as you were okay. going through. So there was some discussion about uh, ResearchGate and other sources, and, yeah. and you want to include that, and I think you, you, you picked that up. Um, there's a specific question about um, the counter data and the fact that a lot of libraries are moving to counter five reports. Yeah. Yep. Does that make a difference? It's a great Yep, that's a great question. So when this tool launched in November, Counter Five was not uh, was not universally used um, at that point, and so it launched with Counter Four. We are in the midst of moving to Counter Five. That's obvious, but it's not quite as easy as just um, importing that new 
um, that new format because also the metrics have changed there a little bit, right? What's, what's actually counted. And we want to make sure that we um, adjust, we do the right um, quality assurance and make our parameters all match so that we can give people insight into what does this mean now? And uh, as a result, we think it'll probably take another uh, month or two before we've got counter five support. Yeah, but in the meantime, we are um, active losing counter four and the JR1 reports. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, this, can you say something about the, you know, you've got the five year window. And so yeah. I assume you model such that in five years' time, a smaller proportion will be fulfilled by back files because. Exactly. Back files have a specific. That's exactly right. Yep. Yeah. That's exactly right. Okay. All right. So you don't need to say anymore. <laughs> okay. All right. so that, that's the biggest, you know, you put your finger on it. That's the biggest um, uh, thing that will change over the course of the five years. That said, we also model other things changing. So one is, um, as we, as I think people on the call know even better than I do, uh, the big deals cost more and more every year, right? As does a subscription price for a journal. So we've got parameters where you can put in the percentage growth per year um, uh, for both your big deal, so we can average that in, as well as the, as the a la carte subscription cost growth. So that's another thing that's changing over those five years. Um, a thing that we're not modeling yet, but we have hope to roll out soon, is that the journals are publishing a different amount of papers and every year. And so some journals that are publishing more and more papers, we we should model that they're going to you you will in the future be getting more views from them than you are right now and the ones that are um, getting decreasing number of papers maybe because a lot of their authors are publishing in gold open access journals right now right that's one of the i think that's one of the open access changes that are happening all those papers being published in gold oa journals they're not just new papers that weren't elsewhere they're papers that would have been most of them are papers that would have been published in subscription journals are now in gold open access journals so it's really important too to model that some journals are actually decreasing the number of papers they're publishing every year and so over the course of the next 5 years the subscription price for them will become less and less a good deal so I get that so I'm giving you that taste not because that's in the code right now it's not actually but we we're um, prioritizing getting an accurate um, estimate and we want to keep making it uh, more and more accurate over time so one of the reasons that it's a yearly subscription instead of a one-off fee um, there's two reasons really one is because you've got multiple publishers that you'll want to negotiate for um, and and those happen at different in different years um, and and even after you've if you've walked away from your big deal, it's still useful to see um, what should you do now. And the other reason that it's a it's an um, ongoing fee is we intend to continue to make this model be as accurate as possible. And that's true with COVID uh, realizations, that's true with open access realization. What, how does the modeling change if there's um, uh, some open access um, uh, changes that weren't expected and so on. So we're, we're c continuing to keep it um, up to date on that. And so people who, so, so a continuous subscription lets you get our best take uh, sort of at any point in time. <laughs> yeah. um, there was a couple of questions about currency, but I, you've addressed those. Yeah. I, and I guess in the meantime, that if you're in the UK, you could just ignore, you could just pretend those dollar signs were pound signs and it's a good question. And you know what we should, so we've got a user discussion forum. And as most things are, it's a little quiet right now. So if anyone's feeling bold and brave, it would be a real good, a, a lot of discussions about using unsub and about walking away for big deals are happening in small groups, I think, right? And there's some value in that. And I can see why people might not want to make all of those conversations in public. But I also think there is some use for some of those conversations to be in public, particularly around here's what I found from UNSUB or what did you guys think when you looked at this? Does that make sense? Or how did you, we're a small institution, did you guys notice this? So we're hoping to, by making a publicly available user discussion group, that some of those conversations can start to happen in an open place where we can all learn from each other. And I think it, people might think, well, then the publishers will hear, but the 
publishers know anyway. So let's not like, let, let's just own that. Right. So, um, so anyway, the, the, a currency discussion, so little hacks around how to best handle the currency discussion would be a great thread in that user discussion group. So if anyone wants to start that, that would be fantastic. The user discussion, I don't think I've put a link here. I'll add it to a chat later, but you can also just Google uh, unsub user discussion group. It's a Google group, but and, and I'll make sure. Sorry, you're but, having people who aren't already sort of uh, customers. Yes, of yes, for sure. If for prospective customers, very happy for you to join. Great question. Yeah, and ask questions that would be relevant for you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and and so just more a little bit more concretely on the um, currency. So I'm Canadian. So for what it's worth, if your nose is a bit out of joint that I keep talking about U.S. dollars, I've been there. I've lived there my whole life too. So I'm right there with you. Uh, but that's our pra pragmatic reality right now. Um, so so the default prices we're using for Elsevier are all in US dollars. Wow. So one thing you'd have to do if you wanted to just pretend they're all in pounds yeah. is actually upload a price sheet that's all in pounds, wow. okay? Now that's actually sort of the step we need, one of the steps we need to do to make it support pounds. But if in the meantime, if you want, if you've got a price list and you want to upload it to your account, specifically, you don't need to wait for us. You could just do that and then um, and then right on and then just treat everything else uh, like a, like a, like it's in pounds. All of the math does indeed just work out just the same. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, that issue perhaps leads into another one that a few people have spoken about is that, uh, you know, the, the consortial nature of, of the purchasing that's in, in the UK and the fact that yeah. you work with GIS. Yeah. The, might there be some things that are done centrally? And, and I know that you're, you're talking with GIS. Yeah. Yeah, we are. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. Relatively yep. early days, I think. Yep, relatively early days, but I think also people know it's a timely issue. So I think um, I think people who are listening have a few choices. They could go ahead and buy right now. And if you buy right now, the price is $1,000 US. Uh, you can buy it with a P card and have it today. You can't quite have your data uploaded today, but you can have your data uploaded real soon in just a few days. So that's one choice. Another choice is you could wait and see what we announce uh, with JISC and the ability to buy a subscription through JISC. Now we're figuring that out and I don't know the timeline of that. I don't even know if it'll happen, um, but, but for clarity, that is, an, that is an option and that is actually how it happened with Canada uh, with CRKN. Uh, the, they bought subscriptions Anyway, it, which is a different different thing than JISC, but yeah. So so, um, and I think that's could that's useful to do even if JISC were to buy a version that's just for JISC, for example, that lets JISC do its negotiations with maybe with your data in it. But there's a version there that maybe JISC is looking at, um, but you don't have the ability to do that fine tuning. So yeah. I think it 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 really just sort of depends on. Uh, on on the on the timeline um, people are looking at and maybe how much autonomy they want uh, and it, it is early days uh, with JISC and we're happy you you can ask JISC about that um, and you can ask us too yeah uh, brilliant um, one of the things about the consortial um, view of this would be that you could imagine a group of universities coming together and saying okay well you know we will we will purchase these hundred Elsevier titles, if you publish, if you purchase those hundred. Yeah, that's true. So, and, and do interlibrary loan. So one thing that people have said, and I kind of love this question because it definitely presupposes a really big change in the world, which is great, right? People are like, but if everybody does this, then there won't be anybody left to interlibrary loan from. Yeah. And first of all, okay, that sounds like a pretty good problem if we're really there in some ways. I mean, not, not in other ways, but that's a pretty, you know, that's a pretty big change where we are right now. But then, yeah, for sure. Let's figure out how to work with that, right? That means all of a sudden there's a tool that's needed to let, let people figure out how we're going to split uh, this, you know, across universities or whatever. So the tool doesn't support that, it doesn't support that itself right now, but I do agree you people could do it like that right now they could say look here's the journals i would subscribe to i've exported here's the journals i would subscribe to and and sort of merge spreadsheets and say okay well you take the top half i'll take the bottom half that's totally true yeah 
Okay. Yeah. Uh, and then thinking a little bit more about there's some specific questions around um, uh, Elsa and the big deal and the fact that in the UK cell press titles aren't included. So yeah. is it a, you, you, I guess you can exclude those from. Yeah. The, good question. Uh, so, so that hasn't been a, um, it hasn't been very often requested yet with the customers we've had to exclude titles. We've often done it when people have walked away from their big deals already and they just want to look at the titles they currently subscribe to and, and work sort of within that universe. So we do have that ability to say, for you to send us a list of your ISSNs in a spreadsheet and say, make my dashboard only show these. So you could make, you could send us that list that doesn't include the cell titles. Um, yeah. And indeed, if it turns out that everyone in the UK is in the same situation, we certainly don't want to need to everybody in the UK to do the exact same thing. We'll try to figure out a way to make it uh, more convenient. So, yeah, let us know. Okay, that's great. Um, you answered the questions about subscription costs, I think. Um, aggregators, um, like Ed's yeah. Like, uh, yeah. when, when, when you're getting access to some back files through um through those um yeah you've obviously heard that question before how does how, how do you handle that yeah that's a great question and the truth is we're not so and i think there's there's two different questions maybe one is when you've um, the aggregators come into. One is, where, what do you do with their usage metrics? So if things are going in clinical key, for example, which is a different way of, of place that the usage metrics can sort of go in uh, elsewhere, how do we bring those in? And a separate thing is, what if we've got backfile uh, through JSTOR or, or so on? So both of those were actually still, are still works in progress for us, partly because we don't, we wanna make sure we bring them in in a way that facilitates this good decision making. So I think that for the ones that are backfile, that's gonna be pretty easy actually, because if what we're modeling is, I wanna look at my Elsevier subscriptions, I'm just gonna assume I keep subscribing to the thing that's providing you that backfile. Then, then I think we'll just hold that part, we'll load that, we'll, we'll turn on that you've subscribed to those things and then let you fiddle with your Elsevier. And sometime if there's enough um, interest, maybe we could let you fiddle this too. But that's not where we'll start, I think. We'll just let you turn this on and fiddle this. Now that, for what it's worth, um, we've been getting that question quite a bit and our timeline looks like the summer, I right. think, probably for, for facilitating that. Okay. Right. Um, there's a, a really interesting, um, almost strategic question um, uh, that's come in, which is about um, green. And so if you've yeah. got a journal with a larger percentage of green access, yeah. then your cost per download will probably be higher because you, you, you're getting a lot of the usage through, through yeah. green. And then you may decide that you don't want to, you don't want to, can, you want to cancel that one. And then you almost, you're almost, penalizing the good behavior of that journal. So the, that journal is saying, yes, you can have lots of green access, but then you're canceling it. So is there, have you thought of, yeah. it's not really a modeling question so much, it's more yeah. like a strategic question. Uh, for what we we have thought of that. And I think what, we're, what we think is the right answer to that is to give librarians the data and let and trust them to make the decisions. And depending on your financial situation, and it's, it might be the right time for you to uh, subscribe to those green OA journals, even though they're not the most effect cost effective journals because you want to support them. Or maybe it's not. And, and so our, we don't think the right answer to that is to just not tell anybody because maybe they'll actually cancel things because something's got a lot of open access. Nope, let's tell them. Yeah. So, uh, so we are revealing here how much green open access things have. And so people can, and perhaps should indeed take that into their, um, into their consideration. Furthermore, it's whether or not it's a society journal. So right. even if it's not green OA, maybe we don't want to take the, maybe we don't want to prioritize canceling society journals um, right now, even if they're cost effective. So there actually was not a good um, resource, either open or closed for what Elsevier journals 
or Wiley journals or society journals. And in the fall, we actually crowdsourced one. So I think that some people listening are actually contributed to that, uh, which is pretty exciting. So we just had this great big long list of journals when people scoured the internet and decided whether it was a society journal or not. And we since released that CC0 for other people to build on. And, and that data is being pulled in here so that you can factor in, um, is it, so this one's not a society journal, but perhaps it is, and that may make either a tiebreaker or you might allocate 5% of your budget where you'll just support the journals that you think deserve to be supported, that kind of thing. Okay, so it's, it's very, um, at, at the journal level, you can sort of pick and choose and make individual decisions. And, and I guess like you were saying about whether or not, you know, your, uh, your Dean of Medicine is, um, is on the editorial board of. Yep. <laughs> yep. 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 Or you might want to get rid of it, depending on how yep. like you're the Dean of Medicine. Yep. Um, I know that's real, sorry, just one sec, because that's real life, right? And we really want to make this tool useful. So one thing I'm not quite sure I've stressed enough, so let me stress it one more time. We would love to make this useful. So if you're looking at it and you're like, you know what, this is almost useful, but we would love to hear the but. So send us an email um, and tell us because we really want this tool to, to help um, make, these, make these decisions. Yeah. Um, I know that we're pushing time, but there was also a few questions that came in about the APC sides of things. So yeah. if, if we're, you're, we're happy to continue for a, a little while. Um, I don't know what this says. All the questions about uh, subscriptions came in the, in the Q&A and all the questions about APCs came in the chat. I don't know if that's a different, different types of people. I'm not quite sure what that is. So you mentioned um, the, the um, uh, the split in authors, so the author numbers yeah. and such like. You know, a lot of people, when they're thinking about paying APCs, are very concerned about who the corresponding author is. Yeah. And so that's maybe, you know, normally it's the corresponding author whose institution will pay. Is yeah. that something that you can sort of feed in? Or is yeah. it an sort of, um, author percentage split that you, you would do? Yeah, great question. So right now, it is just an even split. And we, so I think it is true that the corresponding authors is often the one who pays. That is, like, depends on the field, but I think that is often true. Um, there's been some studies that looked at different um, ways of modeling it by the corresponding author, the first author, the last author, an even split of authors. Um, and, all, and on any given paper, it makes a difference in the amount and uh, where it's allocated. But across a lot of papers and across a lot of journals, it tends to uh, be um, evened out. Now, it's not evened out entirely because some very prestigious institutions, for example, might disproportionately be the corresponding author compared to a less prestigious institution because the corresponding author is often the one with all the research funding and so on, right? So it doesn't entirely weigh out. And so it's a, it's a reasonable question. I think one way we, um, so because of that, we would actually like to have corresponding author in here. Unfortunately, that data is not available. It, it's not captured in a standard way and revealed in a standard way other than for a few publishers like PLOS, for example. So, um, so we're not, so we're, we're making do in the meantime. There's not a way for you to upload um, corresponding author information, mostly because most people don't have it. Um, one thing we are looking at, um, is having a waiting to sort of say, yes, my institution tends to be more of a paying institution or my, my institution tends to be less of a paying institution and sort of see that way you can at least do some risk balancing around it. Or for example, we can look in, in PLOS. In PLOS is your institution disproportionately the corresponding author or not. So I think that gives you a bit of insight into where we might, how we might refine this um, sort of the, as the next step or two. Okay, great. Um, I sort of flicking through. I sort of give, um, another question that I'm, I haven't picked up, but I'm just um, thinking about is the um, pre-publication articles. So if articles aren't available through interlibrary loan, yeah, um, is that um, how would how would how would access to those articles? But I suppose some some of those are made freely available by the publisher anyway, aren't they? I think. I don't know. And well, I don't know how frequent that is. No, no. I've got some background music and um, neighbors. So, so if anyone hears some music, it's, um, mm -hmm. that's what that is. Um, I think, I think uh, I've, we've covered most of the questions. 
um, uh, either through the in the course of the presentation yeah. or um, in that really helpful um, 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 Q and A session. Um, I you you were offering Heather that if people had questions uh, or yeah. if I if I've missed them, if I haven't expressed them yeah. properly, or if people think yeah. of anything else. So right we on. will share your contact details uh, yeah. when we share the recording of the, um, of the uh, um, of, of, of this presentation. I think the point to emphasize again is, that, is the discussions with GIS um, that you're having. And some people have, have spoken about that and about um, the how useful they would find doing something centrally. So I suppose my my um, point to UK colleagues is, and I know that we have a colleague from uh, from just listening in. My my point is that if people feel this would be a useful thing to have, then they should contact JISC. Um, That's right. Uh, and to try and um, try and promote that. Um, apart from that, I think um, uh, you know it's all all that's left is for me to for me to thank you again. Um, to say, I think that doing a live demo from halfway around the world um, is, is is the definition of bravery in this world at the moment. In our world, for, for the moment, so thank you. For that. Uh, a huge amount of interest, and uh, there will continue to be so uh, because, as you say, you know, the, the, we need to make informed decisions, and we need to make them quite quickly. Um, I think one of the questions about the different publishers, so I, I mentioned the fact that the UK is going to negotiate with Elsevier um, over the next sort of 18 months, but I think people will be looking for at other big deals very quickly. So, you know, can they make savings in the next six months? So I think there may be some pressure um, to look at some of the other publishers as well, um, but that will be for uh, the participants to, uh, to express that uh, to you. Um, so, yeah, so thank you very much. Thank you all for participating for your questions. And once again, thank you so much, Heather, for your time and um, a fascinating presentation. Thanks so, very much, everybody. Bye-bye.